Okay, so many familiar faces. This is great. It's that many fewer names I have to learn. Let's look around. Some people have different haircuts, Justin. <laughs> Um, some people are wearing glasses who weren't wearing glasses last spring. So join the nearsighted club. Let's see, who else? Wait, it doesn't look like we have as many Alex's as we had last spring. Well, let's see, there's one, two, Spitzer's not here. Where? Oh, hey, sorry. So we got at least three Alex's. Shouldn't the plural of Alex be? at the alices, like index indices that, no? Okay, anyway. Yeah, like in German, yeah, okay. Well, anyway, um, just to make sure you're in the right place, this is EC3250, and I guess I'll write a little bit on the board about that, just. This is ECE3250, and I'm out of practice writing on the board in the big room, and by the way, if you, I'm not using a room microphone, at this point, if, and if you at any time can't hear me, just tell me that and I'll, you know, if necessary, I will start using the room microphone. And the title of the course is Mathematics of Signal and System Analysis. This is my name. And best way to reach me is email, dfd1, and my office is 329 Rhodes. And you're welcome to stop by anytime the door is open uh, if you want to see me. I don't keep rigid weekly office hours, but just send me an email and I can usually get you in for an appointment within a day or half a day or something. So that's not a big deal. And we have some folks helping us out with the class. We have a TA, an MN student, Rishi Sharan, who is going to be, he's right here. Introduce yourself, wave. He, he took the course two years ago. And now he's studying for his MN at Cornell. And we have two undergrad course assistants who are like sort of proto TAs, both of whom aced the class last fall. And that's Joel Llewellyn, who is not here, I don't think, and Nicholas Tan, who is also not here. They don't have to be here. But he doesn't have to be here either. Yeah, OK. So anyway, um, so their, their contact info is now on the Blackboard website. We, we have our website on Blackboard. Uh, we haven't decided about office hour arrangements and that sort of thing. I'll get to you when we've done that. OK, so just structure of the class. We have two prelims and a final. And the Wednesday class is, even though it says it's a discussion online, it's not. It's just another lecture. OK, and we're going to have our two prelims during Wednesday on two separate dates. One of them is going to be like the Wednesday before fall break, and the other one's going to be like the Wednesday before the week of Thanksgiving. Not the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, because you don't have classes that day. And so those are when our prelims are going to be. And I know there's some people in the class who have a conflict only with that Wednesday class. Like I think OS or some other course, maybe OS conflicts with the whole class, I forget. But there's some other courses where they have a class that Wednesday, and I said, it's fine. You can take EC3250, just get your notes from somebody, whatever. They can do that. Um, but make sure, you know, we can, we can work around your other class if you're one of those people for the prelims. We can have you take it another time or something. And regarding getting someone else's notes, we, we're actually going to do a video note for this class. And we've done that before. We did it in fall of 2011. You will have access to the fall 2011 video notes if you want to see like what people were wearing back then and all that, you know, that kind of thing. That was a really cool class. It had some very cool people in it. Like Jeremy Blum, I don't know if you've heard of him. He was one of our really super hotshot entrepreneurial type undergrads. He was in that class. There were, there were several people who were superstars in that class. And one of the reasons I want to make those accessible to you is that having taught EC2200 last spring to many of you, I kind of know what you've seen better than I did before. And I kind of know, I know what Tong taught. How many people took EC2200? How many people didn't take EC2200? And you're probably from other majors, right? Like, what, where are you from? Bioengineering. Bio oh, cool. Well, that's fine. You probably had some, something else. And what about you? Mechanical, and there was someone over here. Yep. AEP. All right. So there's, are there any CS students in the class? Usually we have a couple. Okay, there's two. Anyway, 
Um, anyway, so I know more what you had in EC2200, so I think I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to streamline a few things in this class and try, as I've been trying for many years, to introduce some new material on wavelets and possibly at the end of the semester on elementary convex analysis. We'll see how that works. I'm really hoping to get a, at least a couple lectures about wavelets in there because that, that's really important stuff. And I want to keep the old notes available because when I do streamline some things, I want to be able to say, go to the 2011 video notes and watch this lecture if you want a, a more detailed talk about that, you know, whatever. So, so that's what, one of the reasons I'm making those available. And of course, the fact that we have video note is not an invitation not to come to class. But I know, you know, I know there's some people who never come to class, like your friend Brian. Although he's probably not, he's not, he, he's not, well, Sam, well, yeah. <laughs> we talked about that the other night, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, um, okay, so anyway, it, but, you know, I won't be too offended if you don't show up. I'll be a little, but the thing about video note is that I can call out people when they're not here. I could say, wait, isn't Steve Slaughter here? No, no. Yeah, I know you're here, but, but if, you were, <laughs> if, you weren't, if you weren't here, I could call you out on the video now and everyone would laugh and say, ha ha, he got you. <laughs> All right, so th that's a threat. Okay, so um, there's going to be some homework assignments. They're not going to be every single week. They'll, the density on homework will be a little higher toward the beginning of the semester than toward the end. And the homework will be graded some. We're going to have these, these folks grading about two problems on every assignment. And I'm not going to announce what those two problems are. In advance, I want you to do the homework. That's the main objective of the homework is a learning exercise. It's not an evaluative exercise. It's not going to count for that much. It's only going to count for like 12, 15 percent of your grade max. And one of the reasons it doesn't count for so much is I want you to talk to each other on the homework. Same, same kind of rules as we had in 2200. I want, you know, I want people to feel free to interact. And if the folks grading the homework see a little too much resemblance between people's papers. I will call that to your attention. I'll say, look, you're not supposed to let your friend do it and then copy, you know. You do problem five, I'll do problem seven. You know, that doesn't work because actually the best way to learn this stuff is to do the homework. So homework will be graded is the bottom line, but it won't be graded. It won't count for too much and I want it to be a pleasant experience. I don't want it to be like a smackdown every time you get your homework back. Oh my God, you know, why don't I only get a six out of ten? So, you know, I'll talk to these guys and make sure they understand that. And as far as what everything counts, I haven't decided the exact numbers, but the, you know, it's going to be something like, you know, 23% on the prelims, 37%, I don't know, on the final. We'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, any questions about that sort of, in my opinion, boring mechanical stuff? Yeah, Erica. What day each week are we going to have homeworks due? It'll be erratic. It'll be highly erratic to maximize your discomfort <laughs> so that, you know, when you, you know, have 30-30, I'll make sure you have a homework due the day of the prelim. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think it'll, pro it'll probably be due, I don't know, I don't know. It, I want to give you at least like a, a week and a week and a half to do them and, and I'll upload them. Uh, what I'll do is every time I put a homework up, I'll send you an email alert, there's a homework up. That kind of thing. And same with solutions. Too young. There's no lab for this class, no. One of the reasons we have this Wednesday lecture is to make sure we keep ourselves honest calling it a four credit class. So we've got, we've got the requisite number of contact hours between faculty and students, you know, that kind of thing, without a lab. Any other mechanics type questions? Yes, David. Is there a textbook? Oh, I forgot to mention, yes, there is a quasi-textbook. And, uh, and I was going to talk about that a little later, but I'll tell you now. Anyway, um, the reason there's no book book is because of the way this course has evolved. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. But the book is this thing I've been writing for the class. And it's, it's almost done, not quite. It still lacks about three chapters and a table of contents and an index. It's available for free online. And it doesn't have a title yet, but I think it's going to be called Mathematical Tools for Signal and System Analysis, and it's going to have like a picture of an exploded parts diagram of a vice grip on the cover, you know, something like that. Um, but anyway, um, there's a difference between knowing how a vice grip is put together and knowing how to use a vice grip. And, uh, you know, think about that for a second. But anyway, um, 
This is, it's not written like a textbook in the sense that it doesn't have lots of pictures and examples and problems and all that. So I don't feel comfortable calling it a textbook, so I'm calling it a monograph. So when I say the monograph, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, I know it sounds kind of like pompous and whatever. Rishi? The monolith? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they had like seven friends taking the class together. They all sat where you guys are. Ricardo, that's about where Marcus used to sit. And uh, I always wonder what he was thinking. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so do you? Wh what is he up to this year? So C, you take EC3250 and you work for some hedge fund. What, you have a future. Okay. I bet they're having a good time this week. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, hedge funds are the ones who bet against the market, you know, by and large. So yeah, there, that's the book. It's, it's the monograph. And, and I won't be, there, there's more in that than, than we're covering in class. There's more detail, more exposition. But the good thing about having something that I wrote is that I know exactly how everything is done in there and when I'm in class I can go through something I could try to give you the main idea and I, I could punt the proof the details whatever to the monograph and I think that's a useful thing to be able to do because I think it's kind of boring to watch really detailed proofs on the board and this of course is a math center course so anyway that's the book any other questions about the mechanics of course this is the most comfortable lecture hall on campus, I think. You have so much leg room, even in the back. Compare it to Upson B17. You know, no comparison, right? And it, it, you know, it's weird. It's kind of deja vu -ish because the last time I saw a lot of you guys was right in here, right? Back in May, yeah. And you, it was probably like your last final or something because it was late and. So it's kind of like you went to sleep and I went to sleep over the summer. We woke up and we're back in the same room. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I wanted, I, I, t I wanted to tell you a few, just a very brief history of this class. Where did it come from? What's different about it from other classes at other universities in the same sort of general area? And so on. Way back when, we didn't have any kind of signal stuff for sophomores. We had 2300, our digital logic course, for those of you not in ECE. And we had 2100, our circuits course, for those of you not in ECE. And we didn't have anything on signals. And it seemed kind of weird that, that we didn't have that. So some of our former, some of our faculty members, actually one of them is still here, but one of them is, is now moved to Northeastern University, Professor Hamami, came up with this idea of teaching a sophomore level class in signals that was centered on you know, at a lower level than most of our, than, than the junior, typical junior classes in signals and systems. And that's where 2200 came from. At that point, because 2200 was a big drain on faculty resources, we, after a couple of years, we didn't have enough bodies basically to cover our, our junior level classes and signals anymore. So really what happened was we ported a lot of that to the senior year and we pushed some more stuff from the junior classes down into the 2200. And then there was this huge gap in the curriculum. One of our faculty members went on leave one year, and when he came back, he ha didn't have anything scheduled for him to teach. And so he decided, and he was, he was another very mathematically oriented guy, now retired, he decided that he was sick and tired of all these Cornell undergrads going through our math courses, you know, 1910, 1920, Diffie-Q, linear, algebra, and not really learning it, okay? So he decided what he wanted to do in his free semester was teach a remedial math course, essentially, to ECE undergrads, and, and so he did that. And he, the book he used was this book, it was basically a linear algebra book, you know. So really, in a sense, he was redoing some stuff about sequences and series and some linear algebra stuff, okay. And I thought, well, you know, he's right that the students don't really learn the math, but really, is that, is, that, is that a good use of our curricular time? But I didn't say anything, you know, until the following spring, the associate director told me that I was supposed to teach that course the following fall. He says, you teach the new course. And I'm like, okay. And, and I felt kind of queasy the first time I went through it because it was, it was just like, why am I teaching a remedial math course to juniors at Cornell? You know, this is, isn't there a better way? You know, maybe there weren't all those online tutorials. This was around 2007 or six or so that there are now. But anyway, I decided that it would be better to do the following. Okay, yes, we have a math problem with students coming 
from our Cornell math courses and not really having a great command of this stuff. Wouldn't it be great to be able to at least solve that problem partially, but also piggyback on the fact that they've had 2200, this sophomore class, to give them a really souped up, sophisticated, on steroids kind of understanding of signals and systems issues beyond what we even used to do at the junior level. So the bottom line is, this is supposed to be a course that has two missions. One mission is to solidify your math and to introduce you to some new math as well. Some, I'm sure some of it's stuff you've never seen before, some notation you've never seen before, but it's useful. Solidify your math and doing that by contextualizing it with signals, systems type ideas and at the same time give you a really boosted up, ramped up kind of intro uh, under the hood, all the details, sweating everything that we didn't sweat in 2200 stuff about signals based on this math that we now have available at our disposal. So that's, those are the two sort of horns on the devil, I don't know, two purposes of the class to do those two things. Okay, and I don't know, I, we'll see how it goes. The reason I had to write this monograph is because this course sits at a level that's uncommon for such courses. Like there's a famous book by Oppenheim and Wilski that every good university seems to use for their junior level signals and systems class. It's an awesome book. But this course is a cut above in terms of rigor. And it's below grad level text. So I really needed something else. And that's why I ended up writing this thing. This, the, mo the monolith, monograph, whatever. <laughs> OK, so, so any questions about that stuff? before we move ahead. And, and Dan, don't worry, we won't be requiring any musical knowledge. <laughs> I know that was really off-putting to you, and perhaps to other people last year. Although we have band members, as always, right? You, well, you have one. How, uh, any other band members besides David Lee here? OK, cool. OK. Yeah, you, so, there was a question in the middle there. Some, oh, Erica. Monolith. <laughs> the monograph, yeah. Yeah, it's Blackboard, unfortunately, when they changed over Blackboard, they put in some default content areas. And so when I copy the course over from the past, the, my old content areas that I had to make up names for myself are sort of sitting with the new content areas. I'm going to try to figure out how to delete the, the default ones and mine are left. But in course documents, that's where you'll find it. And you'll also find kind of a fossil record of all the different versions. And, and I'm constantly updating it. I'm, I'm completely rewriting the DFT chapter, for example, uh, that we're going to get later on the semester. And I'm looking for typos. Anybody who finds typos, you, you curry favor with me, basically. So find me some typos. People who are very anal about reading are, are really good at finding typos. I saw there's a double period on page 165, you know. These are the kind of things you just can't see when you wrote the stuff. So, any other questions? Okay. Well, maybe we, we should start talking about real stuff then. Let's let's do that. Let's talk about some real stuff. We'll not waste a whole day. Oh, and uh, since it's an hour and fifteen minute lecture, uh, I'm, the custom is going to be like a three minute break sometime in the middle. I might skip that today because it's kind of more of a casual kind of lecture, but who knows. And about the board, um, I'm not going to be using PowerPoint. I hope you don't mind. And I'm out of practice writing on the board, so if it's too small or illegible, tell me, please. I'll get better at it as the weeks pass by. And third of all, people have told me that I write fast and or talk fast. And please don't worry about that. I mean, it, it's, it's better, since we have video note also, it's better if you're one of those people who finds him or herself sitting there like scribbling, 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 not, not thinking at all about what's going on. It might be better just to do the scribbling with the video notes, right? And just kind of hang out in class and try to get, you know, get a handle on what's going on if, it's, if it seems to go by too fast. But if you, think, if you think I'm writing too fast or talking too fast, please let me know and I'll, I'll try to stop. Okay. All right, so this is a course in Mathematics of Signal and System Analysis. It is primarily a course in math, is what it is. It's a course in a lot of interesting, to me at least, and I think it's good for your head, by the way, to take math courses. Interesting to me stuff that's mathematical. And you may think, okay, well here, what is engineering? 
engineering is kind of like, you know, you didn't really know what it was in high school, maybe. Maybe, maybe you do nowadays because you have all these resources you can, you can look at online. But, but I always like to think of engineering as it's kind of a mixture of math, science, and artifice, cleverness, you know, whatever. Tho those three things kind of mixed together in some mixture is what makes engineering. And you think to yourself, well, math and science, those are kind of cut and dried, right? And the artifice, the, the kind of cleverness, that's where the wiggle room comes in. That's where the coolness of engineering all happens. But actually, that's not the case. Math and science are not as cut and dried as you think they might be. Like, you've all heard of, you know, quantum mechanics and all the mysteries that attend that. And the fact that quantum mechanics sits here, relativity sits here, and they still haven't managed to make them work together after all these years. And and Schrodinger's cat, and you, you know, you can all on and on and on about how weird and uncut and dried science is. And AEP majors know that well, don't they? Yes, okay. So, there's no comfort in science. It's not cut and dried. But there must be comfort in math, right? Okay, I'm trying to sell you a bill of goods here. Math, you know, we know how to do math. The things are right, things are wrong. You know, there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. So math is cut and dried. That's the proposition I'm going to try to shoot holes in today to start with. Okay, so why isn't math cut and dried? Well, some people tried to make it that way. Toward the end of the 1800s, there was a small army of people who tried to come up with a firm foundation for all of mathematics as we're known up to that time, much of which had been sort of cobbled together over the centuries in an ad hoc way. And they thought, we're going to base all of mathematics on two unassailable pillars. And, you know, when you think about it, basing a big thing on two pillars is always kind of a risky proposition. But the two pillars they chose were logic and set theory. So, so late 19, 18, 1800s, 19th century, um, Frege, Gottlob Frege, who was a great German philosopher and mathematician et al., and they weren't all working together, but he was sort of the main guy. And an example of the et al. was David Hilbert, another German, sought to base all of mathematics. They sought a firm foundation for all of mathematics in logic and set theory. Okay, so why did they use those two? Why did they think of using those two as their firm foundation pillars? Pretty much because they seem pretty cut and dry. These things are cut and dried. Even if all math isn't, at least these things are. And they're kind of unassailable. So logic. Logic is stuff like if A is true, then the statement, quote unquote, A is true, is also true. Or if A is true, and if A implies B, then B is true. That's a famous logical law called modus ponens. If A is true, and if B is true, then the statement, quote unquote, A and B is also true. Th these are cut and dried parts of logic. And so you think, oh yeah, I get that, you know, A, not A, all that kind of thing. But even logic has some weird stuff going on. Like, like there's the, the law of the excluded middle in logic says essentially that every declarative sentence has a truth value. It's either true or its negation is true, which is another way of saying it's false. Okay, so every declarative sentence has a truth value. But what about this one? What about it will rain in Ithaca tomorrow? Is that true? I mean, I don't think it. Ha I think, I think that sentence hovers in a Schrodinger's cat-like way between being true and false, because it can't be assigned a truth value except in retrospect, right? And all I used I, I, that was not the original one that people used to sort of motivate temporal logic, as they call it. The original one they used was, "There will be a sea battle tomorrow." Okay, and so our version of that is, "It will rain in Ithaca tomorrow." 
that sentence is a perfectly good declarative sentence. And you may say, oh wait, no, let's, let's restrict it. Let's say only present tense declarative sentence or past tense. You know, and, and as soon as you start you know, shaving off these exceptions and stuff, you realize how complicated it really is to put together a logic that works. Okay, so logic is not cut and dried. What about set theory? You, you all sort of have an idea of what's a set, right? A set is like a collection of objects. So, so logic is somewhat complicated. So it's not as simple as it looks. What about set theory? Set theory is way more complicated. And I want to try to sell you on that proposition. What is a set? Naively, a set is a collection of objects. So naively, a set is just an arbitrary collection of objects. Like the set of all people in this room, the set of all furniture in this room, listed out, whatever. Those are, those are collections of objects. Okay. Now, you can think of a set in this way as, in some sense, a way of specifying a set would be to list everything that's in the set. Right? So, think of any set as just being the list. I'll put list in quotes because, you know, uncountable, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about that for now. The list of everything in the set. And let's look at a few of those. Let's look at a few sets. The sets can be kind of weird. You know, they don't have to consider, you know, it doesn't, they don't have to have elements, all of which are similar or of the same sort of sphere of life or whatever. They can be really strange collections of objects. So let's just list a few sets. So here's some examples. So here's list A. Okay, so I, I just make these up on the fly every year. So let's see see what we can come up with today. How about uh, how about uh, how about Tiesto, Avicii, Dave Albanese. He's our associate director. Okay. See, uh, I, I'm telling you, they don't have to all be of the same ilk or whatever. And how about, uh, oh, for you, how about Teji Su? Okay. Whatever. Okay, so that's a list. That's a perfectly good list, right? Here's another list. Here's another list. List B. Okay, so, so Rhodes Hall, the Vatican, List A and Radiohead. Okay, so that's even more mixed up than this one. And, and it has a further wrinkle to it. it. It actually lists a list as one of its elements. Okay, so this is supposed to wake you up to the possibility that sets can have as elements other sets. Not just as subsets, but as actual elements. Okay? Here's another list. Let's see, what's this going to be? Let's think. Um, how about uh, people in the room? Okay, Manish. I won't put up your last name, so. Um, three Alexes. Okay, how about someone unrelated to these guys? Go back to the music thing, Dead Mouse. And list C, there's going to be another thing in there. And five is going to be um, Gates Hall. Okay, so this has not only has music, it has people, it has buildings, and it has a list. But what's weird about this one is 
the list it lists is itself, right? And nothing happened when I wrote number four list C there. The sky didn't fall, lightning didn't strike, the collider at CERN didn't end the universe. You know, none of that stuff happened, right? So there's nothing wrong, there's nothing cataclysmic about a set having itself as an element. A list listing itself as a list item. But still, that is a rather anomalous kind of list, I would say. Okay. So, so here's some terminology I'll introduce. A list is anomalous if it lists itself as an item. And if you want to change back to math terminology from list terminology, a set is anomalous if it contains itself as an element. Okay? So surely, even though now we know anomalous lists exist, a lot of lists are not anomalous. Okay? So those are kind of the cool lists, the ones that aren't anomalous. So let's let L sub R be equal to the list of all non-anomalous lists. And if you want to think in terms of sets rather than lists, it's the set of all sets that don't contain themselves as an element. And in terms of the naive definition of a set as an arbitrary collection of objects, that's not a problem. I'm just defining an arbitrary collection of objects. This being the collection of all lists that don't list themselves as elements. And the reason I subscripted this by R is because the idea here came from a great British philosopher and mathematician, Bertrand Russell. Okay? And the R stands for the R in his last name. He came up with the idea of constructing this L sub R. Now why? Why did he come up with that? Well, he, he was really enthusiastic about Frege's et al.'s program for rigorizing all of mathematics based on logic and set theory. But he wanted to make sure that they got all the details right. And he was a little worried about sets. He thought there might be something, something sinister about that arose if one defined a set as being an arbitrary collection of objects. And sure enough, there is. And it's known as Russell's paradox. And it comes from thinking a little bit about this list L sub R. So let me ask you a question. Is L sub R anomalous? I.e., does L sub R list itself as an item? Okay, so think about that for just a second. How do you go about thinking about something like that? What you do is you say, all right, let's consider the statement, L sub R is anomalous, and see where that leads us. If L sub R is anomalous, then, by definition of anomalosity, it lists itself as an item, right? But wait, L sub R is the list of all non-anomalous lists, and I started out by assuming L sub R is anomalous, and I got to the statement that L sub R being a line item on itself is non-anomalous. Okay, so wait, L sub R cannot be anomalous. Let's start with L sub R is not anomalous. It does not list itself as an item. But wait, if that's true, then it has to list itself as an item by definition of the fact that it lists all non-anomalous lists. Okay, see? Problem here. No way to assign a truth value, as they say, to the sentence, L sub R is anomalous. It's neither true nor false. If you assume it's anomalous, you run into the contradiction that it can't be, that it has to be non-anomalous. If you assume the other way, you run into the other contradiction. 
This is what's called a paradox. Okay, so there's no answer to this question. And this is known as Russell's paradox. And there are lots of variations on Russell's paradox, some of which you may have heard in maybe not elementary school, but secondary school. You know, like uh, there's one that goes about, there's a town that has a lot of barbers, and they either shave themselves or have one of their colleagues shave them. And you look at the set of all barbers who don't shave themselves and have, a, you know, I, it's stuff like that. There's, there's ways of doing this in, in a more prosaic fashion. But Russell came up with this, and he wrote a nice letter, a very polite letter to Frege, saying, you know, I was looking at your, your stuff, and I you know, came upon this. Do you have a way out of this? Well, he didn't. You know? and, and, you can Im and Frege was humble and polite and everything about it. But you can imagine how depressing that must have been to someone who had spent years and years and years, assuming that set theory was kind of unassailably simple like logic, and building a, fa a foundation of mathematics on calling a set any arbitrary collection of objects, that this kind of thing happened. Okay, now does every, uh, everyone know exactly what I mean by paradox? A paradox, let me just mention, so here's an aside. A paradox, and I saw <laughs> someone, I, I saw some status update one time on Facebook where someone said, this sounds like Russell's parallax. And I thought, <laughs> face palm, you know. I didn't, I, no, I, I, and it, it was someone I didn't know, thank goodness. No, it was a fr friend of a friend commenting on something that she had written. Okay, so a paradox is a quote-unquote situation where you can't consistently assign truth values. Do they use the expression truth values in digital logic course at all? Yeah? Okay. So you're, you're familiar with that. To all the sort of declarative sentences, implicit or explicit in the situation. So in this case, the declarative sentences we're talking about are Elsebar is anomalous. Period. That's a declarative sentence. We can't assign a truth value to that in any consistent way. Here's an example of something that's not a paradox, just to explain the subtlety of the concept. If I stand here and I say to you, everything I say is a lie. Okay, that's not a paradox. Why is, does anyone know why that's not a paradox? Try to assign a truth value to what I just said and see what happens. First try to assign it true. Does that lead to a problem? How many people think that leads to a problem if I, if I assign the truth value true to the statement, everything I say is a lie? Okay. We might use clickers for this later in the semester so you won't be so shy. And Ricardo, why does that lead to a problem? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if everything I say is a lie, then what I just said to you has got to be a lie. And what I just said was, everything I say is a lie. Wait, no, no. That's, <laughs> if, if the statement is true, then by definition of lying, I can't be telling you the truth, and therefore the statement can't be true. That's a problem. Okay? That, that's the issue there. But wh what if you try to assign this truth value false to it? Does that work out? Okay, uh, how, would, how would someone random tell me why, how does that work out? Yeah, sometimes I might tell the truth, but not now. That, what I just said was definitely a lie. Like, everything I say is a lie. I'm lying when I say that to you, but tomorrow I might tell the truth, right? Get it? So there's no problem in assigning a truth value of false to the statement, everything I say is a lie. Here is a paradox. I am lying right now. Okay. This sentence is a lie. Th that is a paradox. Because there's no way to assign truth value to that sentence either way, true or false, without ending up with a contradiction. 
And there's all kinds of other examples. You know, there's the, the Cretans meet on the street and, and they say um, everything he says is a lie and this guy says he speaks the truth and you have to figure out whether that's a paradox. You know, there's all these cool things you can do with paradoxes. And the plural of paradox should be paradoxes, right? Just like Alice's. Yeah. Anyway, so, so that's what a paradox is. So bottom line is set theory is complicated. You have to be careful. And what, what, what consequence arose from Russell's paradox, you may ask? And what did mathematics settle on? The consequence that arose was that you need to be careful defining what quote unquote set means. It can't just be an arbitrary collection of objects if you want a set theory that works. That is to say, doesn't give rise to paradoxes and stuff. So that's the consequence of Russell's paradox. And so you may say, okay, well, what did they finally decide? What, what did the sort of the, the math bosses finally come up with for set theory? Well, the answer is it's not over yet, okay? Believe it or not, it's not over yet. There are competing set theories around, but there is one that for about a century, in fact, it's almost exactly a century now, has been in force. Did I hear a question or, or a comment or a statement? I just thought it might be interesting. No? Okay. All right, so it's still not settled. Completely. Logic is a lot more settled than set theory, but, but there's one popular, widely accepted set theory is known as ZFC. It's about 100 years old. And if you, if you search on ZFC, I think it'll probably be the first hit. Okay. And the reason it's called ZFC, it's, called, it's Zermelo, Frankel, Set Theory, plus what's called the Axiom of choice, yeah, and, and you'll have actually a homework problem that talks a little bit about the axiom of choice. So Z, F, C, and that's the one you learned about in school. You, know, I, you didn't really have to worry about any of the hairy details of it, but that is the one that we sort of implicitly use in the back of our minds. And essentially what any working set theory does is it restricts the notion of what is a set from an arbitrary collection of objects to a collection of objects that has certain things forbidden, certain things allowed, etc. Okay, so all I'm trying to tell you here is, let's go back to the beginning. Remember, engineering is math plus science plus artifice. And you may think the artifice is the only cool part. Well, logic is somewhat complicated. It's not as cut and dried as you may think. Set theory is even worse, okay, or better if you, if you think of it that way. And, and so there's a lot of subtlety to mathematics and as there is to science. All right, so that's just one little thing to talk about. And part of this early stuff, the, the first couple lectures, I want to establish some notation, some of which will be familiar to some of you and some of which will be unfamiliar to some of you. So as we go along, and I'm going to try to practice using it, 
kind of pedantically at times just to get you used to it. Okay, so in any event, let's assume we have a set theory that works. So, so say we've settled on ZFC or whatever. Here's some set theory notation. Some of this is going to be familiar. Some of it's maybe not so familiar. So phi, that means the empty set. Any set theory that works has got to have the empty set. I dare you to try to come up with one that doesn't. It's the set with no elements. And a typical set is going to be like a capital letter. And if I write little a element of big A, you've all seen this before probably. That means, quote unquote, A is an element of capital A. If you think of capital A as being a list, that means that A is one of the items on the list. Okay. And pardon me for scratching my foot, but I got bitten by some sort of mega mosquito last night. I, I don't know, at, at CTB and Heaven knows where they raise those things. But anyway, um, if I have two sets A and B, A intersect B, you know what that means. And here I'm going to introduce some notation that maybe you haven't seen. A intersect B equals, and I'm going to write this expression down, and I'm going to say what you're supposed to say, at least mentally, while you're writing it or reading it. Like, it's sort of like little kids say it out loud while they're writing it down, but it's like moving your lips when you read. You get over that, okay? A intersect B is, and there's no way for me to write this and be out of the way of everybody, but I'll try. The set of all, that's what that means, A such that, that colon is such that. Some people use a vertical line, I use a colon because mentally I'm saying such that, okay? A is an element of A, and A is an element of B. So the way you read an expression that has thing, colon, and statement is, quote, the set of all A such that A is an element of A, And A is an element of B. Okay, so that notation may or may not be familiar to you. We're going to be using that a fair amount. Like when we talk about, say, summable signals. It's the set of all x in f to the z such that so-and-so is less than infinity. That's that kind of thing. <coughs> so you all know what an intersection is. But you probably, maybe you never saw it written, written out quite that way before. And to get the union of two sets, I just have to change one little thing there, right? Oh, speaking of Tiesto and Avicii. See, this is what we do on video note. We, we plant these little topical things so that years later when people read, watch this video, they'll say, who were Tiesto and Avicii, you know? Um, in my opinion, the two songs, uh, Red Lights by Tiesto and, and Hey Brother by Avicii are ripoffs of each other. If you play them in your head, like, they, they both go high at the same time and they have a similar kind of thing, like, if you think about it. And I don't know who came first, but, 
But I would like to make a mashup of those. I've, I've tried to find one online, and I haven't been able to find one yet. So if anybody can find one, please send it to me. What about the union? It's the set of all little a such that what? Somebody just shout it out. I'm not even looking. Just, yeah, a is in a or. I heard the keyword. And that's not XOR, that's plain old OR. OK, so that, that's an example of notation I want you to get used to, to thinking about using whatever. All right. Now, any set theory worth its salt, any math worth its salt, allows as a set something called the natural number. So here's a really important set. Again, this is notation, the natural numbers. What is the natural numbers? For us, in this class, the natural numbers and the notation I'm going to be using is this n here. And this is known, if you, if you know LaTeX, this is known as, uh, the format is math BB which is supposed to, ooh, road hazard, supposed to stand for math blackboard bold. It's supposed to be a simulated bold face. Okay. So what is the set of natural numbers? The set of natural numbers in some books does not include zero, but in our class it does. It's the set of all non-negative integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I just quickly write it down like that. Okay. So that's the natural numbers. And when I say it's a really important set, that is to say, any decent math system allows this as a set. In other words, this has got to be, in any decent math system, a set under what are, whatever restrictions you impose on collections of objects to make sets. But pause, wait a minute. I just wrote down this set here, n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. What are those things? Like, what is 3? What is 3? Just tell me. Somebody give me a good answer to that question. <laughs> no circularity allowed. OK, here's a tougher question. What is 11? What's that? Say that again. Well, 3 is 2. She said prime. Um, OK, bottom line, I don't have a good answer to what is 3, or what is 11, or what is 19, for that matter, or what is 10 to the 59th. You've heard that number before, most of you. I don't know what these things are. I don't know whether it matters what they are. And I kind of think it doesn't. I kind of think it doesn't matter what numbers actually are. I think what really matters is that they are things that behave in concert in a certain way. It doesn't matter what ontologically they are. In some sense, there's a, there are many different mathematical ontologies that are perfectly reasonable ways of looking at what numbers are. But I don't have a good answer for that question. What is 3? What is 11? What is 19? There is a book that I, I strongly recommend to everybody, um, and I mentioned it in the monograph. It's called Infinity and the Mind by Rudy Rucker, and it was written some 35 years ago. It's a really awesome book, and he actually shows a way to build, and, and I allude to this briefly in the monograph, build natural numbers out of literally nothing. And when I say literally nothing, I mean the empty set. You start with the empty set, and then you have the set consisting of the empty set, and so, you know, it's, it's crazy. But anyway, assuming, even though I don't know what 3 is, what those things are, you all have sort of a grip on what the natural numbers are. And any set theory, any math system allows this as a set. Now, on the natural numbers, there are some operations you can perform, right? And we're often going to be 
interested in sets of things, be they sets of signals or systems or matrices or whatever, where you have some operations you can perform between them. And here's a note. So this is a note. We're going to be coming back to this as we go along. On n, the natural numbers, we have two interesting algebraic operations. To an interesting, that's kind of a difficult word because that's value laden. What I'm doing, when I say something's interesting, I'm sort of implying that if you don't think it's interesting like I do, then you're like lame or something. But I don't mean that. Okay, so I try not to use that word. On end, we have algebraic operations. And you know what they are. Plus and times. You can take any two natural numbers and multiply them together and get another one. You can take any two natural numbers and add them together and get another one. And we have what are called identity elements for both. And what is an identity element? That's something I learned about when I was in, in grade school, but we were doing something called the new math back then in the 60s and 70s. And you maybe didn't learn that expression, but an identity element for an algebraic operation is something where if you do the operation with a thing and that, you get the thing back. So zero is the identity element for plus, because if you take any natural number plus zero, you get the natural number back. And one is the identity element for times, respectively. OK. And these operations are both. Commutative, that's a good word to know. Meaning that you can do A times B is the same as B times A and so on. And associative, that's a good thing to know. And furthermore, you have this distributive law and so on. You, you, these are things you've all sort of seen about the natural numbers. And Notice that only one natural number has an additive inverse. What number is that? Additive inverse is something if you take A and you add its additive inverse, you get the identity element. Zero, yes. Zero has an additive inverse, and that's the only one. So only zero has an additive inverse. And there's only one number, one natural number that has a multiplicative inverse. And what's that? So only one has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so so you have these operations and you have you have some missing stuff, but whatever. That's an important set. And we'll be coming back to that set time and again. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about mappings. And I better learn to move all these desks aside before I start class, because definitely have to be able to move freely between the switches over there and the switches over here, you know, whatever. All right, where are we? OK, so suppose you're given two sets. There's lots of things you can do with two sets besides intersecting them and unioning them and all that kind of thing. And one thing that you may have heard of or not, so given two sets, A and B, what is A cross B? If I write that down, what does that mean? This is called the Cartesian product of A and B. And 
let's use our newfound notation, the set of all things, such that, that stuff, to write out what this is. This is the set of all ordered pairs, A comma B, such that the first guy, A, is in set capital A, and the second guy, B, is in the set cap B. How many people have never seen that notation before? I'm just curious. Never seen Cartesian product notation. And if I ask how many people have seen it, about equally few people raise their hands. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Okay, so that's, that's an important thing to know about. You'll see that a lot. And does anyone know where the word Cartesian comes from? John Cartesian, the famous Armenian mathematician no. <laughs> Cartesian. It totally sounds Armenian. It's Descartes. It's Descartes. And yeah, it's really cool to have something named after you. I, I always say this. I always, so if you look at the old video note, you'll, you'll hear me say this pretty much the same thing. It's always, it's always cool to have something named after you, like so-and-so's theorem. But it's even cooler if you have something, if you have your name with I-A-N at the end, like Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, that elevates you to a new level of coolness. <laughs> okay, but, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, what is epic is, if you have only a piece of your name with I-A-N after it, like Cartesian. It's, they don't call it Descartesian. No, they call it Cartesian. <laughs> that, that's another, yet another, level of coolness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but actually, John Cartesian, that, I, I it never occurred to me how Armenian that sounds. You know, <laughs> Kardashian, Cartesian. <laughs> Does anyone know what Cher's last name is? Sarkeesian. She's Armenian. Cher Sarkeesian. Okay. So there. That, that's a, that's a pop culture trivia question from my era. Okay. All right, so Cartesian product, that's a good thing to know. And here's another piece of notation that I, I know at least one of you, because I talked to him this summer, hadn't seen before. If I have two sets of A and B and I write this down, what does that mean? That means F is a mapping from the set A to the set B. And what does it mean for F to be a mapping from A to B? It means that F is an entity, that's a really good word for this, that assigns to each element of A, each and every one, each little a in the set capital A, a unique element of B, called F of A. Okay, so that's what, that notation for mappings may be something that you haven't seen before, maybe something you have seen before. But a mapping is something, a mapping from one set to another is something that takes every single element of the domain set and points it to some specific element of the range set. Okay? Now, a mapping there's, there's various things that a mapping, properties a mapping can have. So a mapping F from a set A into a set B is and we don't have to number the boards in this room. How about that?
That doesn't sound too good, does it? <laughs> Actually, you know, that sound has been part of this board's behavior for quite some time, and it's just getting worse. And I'm kind of worried that one of these days, you know, there's going to be... If you come up here, you'll see these things are on, like, big old bicycle chains. This is what they look like. Okay, so we're still waiting for something to come after the is. A mapping f from a to b is what we call injective when what is true? When two different elements of a get mapped to different elements of b all the time. No two different elements of a get mapped to the same element of b. So no two different elements of A get mapped by F to the same B in B. And if you want to write that out <coughs> in sort of a more mathematical way, i.e. when a1 not equal to a2 implies that f of a1 is not equal to f of a2. That's what injective means. Surjective, and it's weird, the spell checker I have on my Office Linux thing knows injective, but it doesn't know surjective. Injective must be some medical term about shots or something, I don't know. Surjective, when what is true, every B in B gets mapped to. The mapping hits every B in B. in the sense that every B and B is equal to F of A for some A in the set capital A. And back in school when you heard about mappings the first time, I, I remember this in pre-calc, Sometimes they called injective mappings one-to-one -one and these onto. But it's a little bit sticky, so I, I like to use injective surjective. And finally, what is the, the third property is bijective. And what do you think that means? What's, what's a really slick way, Brian? No, you'll, I'll show you pictures in a sec. Yes, but what if, the, what if two different A, A's get assigned the same? Uh, unique means that the same A can't go two places. Okay, but different A's can go to the same place. Get it? Okay, now answer my question. W what is bijective going to mean? Yes, very good. Slick, a slick way of saying bijective, it's bijective. when it's both injective and surjective. So this is kind of like reading like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears kind of thing. So it not only does it hit everything in B, surjective, but two different elements of A always go to different elements of B. And, and in some sense, a bijective, ma a bijective mapping establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of A and the elements of B. So a bijective f from a to b. And that's why I don't like to use the expression one to one for injective. So it establishes a one to one correspondence between 
the elements of A and the elements of B. Cool. Okay. Now for the promised pictures. Just a couple little pictures here to brighten your day. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm just going to put like each of the sets A and B is just going to be some dots. And I'm going to draw lines between the dots in A and the dots in B to show you what F does. And you're going to tell me whether it's injective, surjective, whatever. So suppose A is these dots and B is these dots. Okay, here's a mapping. It takes this guy to this guy, this guy to that guy. Is that injective? Is it surjective? So it's not injective, not surjective. Maybe you don't know what this, I use that for not, but anyway. Uh, let's do it again. A and B, how about one, two? How about, uh, okay, is that injective? Yes. Is it surjective? Okay, so it's yes, injective, and it's not surjective. Okay, so let's go A and B are like this. How about, uh, is that injective? But it is surjective, right? So it's, it's not injective. So, you know, you don't have to be one or the other. Um, how about this one? How about uh, there? Okay, I'm glad you're hesitating. This violates Brian's condition. See? Not a mapping, right. <laughs> Because this A doesn't go to a unique B. Who said that? Okay, thank you. Um, it's not a mapping. So this is not even, not even a mapping. It's not even, it can't even be a mapping, whatever. Okay, so now you get the idea of injective, surjective, bijective, even though we haven't had any bijective yet. And you probably have some intuition going now, like, uh, is it possible even to have a surjective mapping, say, in this situation when A is these four dots and B is these five dots? I'm asking it in a very suggestive way. You're supposed to say no, you know. Because you can't cover like five bases with four guys, right? You just can't do that. And similarly, is it possible to have injective in this case, where you have five guys in A and four guys in B? No. Because inevitably, by the pigeonhole principle, two different A's are going to have to go to the same destination. And sure enough, with finite sets, it's pretty easy to see whether injective, bijective, surjective things can exist. But when we get to infinite sets, such as the natural numbers, things get pretty complicated. And that's where we'll pick it up next time.